afterward. A strange reality. To conclude, I would like to go a little further in strengthening the ground under the mind's feet. There is so much in transurfing that seems incredible that, alas, one has to keep explaining to the mind that it is all indeed real. Whatever model had been chosen to serve as a foundation for transurfing, its principles would still be valid. In other words, all the principles included here are invariant in relationship to the model. The key principle expresses the idea that the energy of our thoughts not only has an indirect influence on our physical reality, but a direct impact too. The formal line of science still refuses to acknowledge this phenomenon because, so far, experimental testing has yielded ambiguous results. Regardless, you and I need to solve our problems now and cannot wait for the scientists to give their word of approval. We are all aware that the world is subject to the laws of causality in which every effect has its cause. Cause is usually understood to mean some kind of action. The problem is that thoughts are usually perceived as an instruction to a subsequent action and not as the transmission of a physical energy capable of influencing the world around us. Nonetheless, the facts are stubborn and will eventually have their way. The unexplained phenomenon of outer intention has not been totally ignored by science. Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, carried out research into phenomena linked to the interaction between thought and a material reality. Jung analyzed hundreds of curious instances which appeared to be unaccountable coincidences with no visible cause. Jung defined this kind of coincidence, synchronicity. In his lecture on synchronicity, he provides a classical example from his personal practice. On April 1, 1949, I made a note in the morning of an inscription containing a figure that was half man and half fish. There was fish for lunch. In conversation, someone mentioned the custom of making an April fish of someone. In the afternoon, a former patient of mine whom I had not seen for several months showed me some impressive pictures of fish. In the evening, I was shown a piece of embroidery with sea monsters and fish in it. The following morning, I saw a former patient who was visiting me for the first time in 10 years. She had dreamed of a large fish the night before. A few months later, when I was using this series in a larger work and had just finished writing it down, I walked to a spot by the lake in front of the house where I had already been several times that morning. This time, a fish, about a foot long, lay on the seawall. I had no idea how it could have got there. I cannot resist citing another extract from Jung's lecture about a principle you will learn more about later. Jung writes, I could tell you a great many such stories which are, in principle, no more surprising or incredible than the irrefutable results arrived at by Rhine with reference to the experiments involving extrasensory perception, for example, card guessing. Author's note. And you would soon see that almost every case calls for its own explanation. But the casual explanation, the only possible one from the standpoint of natural science, breaks down to the psychic relativization of space and time, which, together, form the indispensable premises for cause and effect relationships. My example concerns a young woman patient who, in spite of efforts made on both sides, proved to be psychologically inaccessible. The difficulty lay in the fact that she always knew better about everything. Her excellent education had provided her with a weapon ideally suited to this purpose, namely 
a highly polished Cartesian rationalism with an impeccably geometrical idea of reality. After several fruitless attempts to sweeten her rationalism with a somewhat more human understanding, I had to confine myself to the hope that something unexpected and irrational would turn up, something that would burst the intellectual retort into which she had sealed herself. Well, I was sitting opposite her one day, with my back to the window, listening to her flow of rhetoric. She had had an impressive dream the night before, in which someone had given her a golden scarab, a costly piece of jewelry. While she was telling me this dream, I heard something behind me gently tapping on the window. I turned round and saw that it was a fairly large flying insect that was knocking against the window pane from outside in an obvious effort to get into the dark room. This seemed to me very strange. I opened the window immediately and caught the creature in the air as it flew in. It was a scarabide beetle, or common rose chafer, Cetonia aurata, whose gold-green color most nearly represents that of a golden scarab. I handed the beetle to my patient with the words, Here is your golden scarab. This experience punctured the desired hole in her rationalism and broke the ice of her intellectual resistance. The treatment could now be continued with satisfactory results. About half an hour after I had been considering whether to include Jung's beetle in the text as an example, a wanderer of quite impressive appearance flew in through the window. It was a beetle similar to the one described above. You may or may not believe me, but I have to confess that I was not at all surprised by the rare visit. It is not that I am so used to the phenomena of synchronicity that they no longer catch my attention. On the contrary, absorbed in my own thoughts, I did not attribute any meaning to it at all. I automatically let the beetle out of the window so that it would not have to look for its way out. It was not until a little time had passed that it suddenly struck me. I am such an idiot. Every time Outer Intention announces its presence, I am still wide-eyed with amazement. They were tugging at me with all their might, trying to show me a sign, whilst I was in a deep, deep, waking sleep. If I was at all superstitious, I would have taken it to be a sign from above. You can imagine how other people are also living life asleep and fail to notice the manifestations of outer intention. There are many more examples like this. From the point of view of transurfing, the situation is quite clear. In isolated cases, visualization generates a strong gust of the wind of outer intention. However, Jung did not rush to make any final conclusions concerning the reason for such coincidences. Whether thoughts caused the event, or thoughts arose as a result of a subconscious premonition of the event. On the one hand, Jung states that thoughts create the foundation for a series of chance events, and on the other hand, I sometimes cannot get away from the idea that there is a certain premonition of the onset of a series of specific events. In his work, Synchronicity, An A-Causal Connecting Principle, 1960, Jung defines synchronicity as the simultaneous occurrence of a certain psychic state with one or more external events which appear as meaningful parallels to the momentary subjective state. Jung hesitated for a long time about whether to publish his work because the phenomenon of synchronicity was inconceivable to traditional scientific thinking. Jung makes a vague and yet, according to the standards of traditional science, relatively bold conclusion. Synchronistic phenomenon prove the simultaneous occurrence of meaningful equivalences in heterogeneous, 
causally unrelated processes. In other words, they prove that a content perceived by an observer can, at the same time, be represented by an outside event without any causal connection. From this, it follows either that the psyche cannot be localized in space, or that space is relative to the psyche. There is no contradiction of the law of causality in the phenomena Jung is describing. There is always a cause. It is just that the interaction dynamics between thought and environment remain elusive to our current understanding. Which is the cause in synchronistic coincidences? Are events shaped by thoughts or do thoughts arise as the premonition of an event? From the point of view of transurfing, both explanations are acceptable. The heart has access to data held in the information field, which can then be interpreted by the mind. The mind, in turn, shapes thoughts which, under the condition of unity of heart and mind, can be manifest as physical reality. These tenets lie at the very core of the transurfing model. However, I should emphasize once again that the alternatives model does not claim to serve as a detailed description of the world. Instead, it represents a benchmark, an aid for the comprehension of certain principles. We still know very little about the world we live in, but this need not prevent us from applying the transurfing principles. The fact that the principles work is for you to discover. All phenomenon related to the impact thought energy has on the surrounding world can be substantiated by the well-known theorem put forth by the quantum physicist John Bell. The theorem sounds, there are no isolated systems. Every particle in the universe is in instantaneous, exceeding the speed of light, connection with every other particle. The entire system, even if its parts are separated by huge distances, works as a unified system. This theorem has been theoretically proven and is already substantiated on a practical level. Despite the fact that instantaneous connection contradicts the special theory of relativity, which claims that energy cannot move faster than light, the theorem has its place. It would seem then that outer intention fails to conform to the theory of relativity. In general, quantum physics is all based on unproven postulates, which means that it too represents a specific kind of model. And there is not just one inexplicable contradiction in the world of quantum physics, but many, which, once again, confirms that undue significance should not be attached to any one particular model. It should be noted that Jung's ideas have found support among the very founders of modern physics, such as Wolfgang Pauli and Albert Einstein. In addition, it is quite probable that the process of information exchange does not have anything to do with energy at all, which is why it can take place faster than the speed of light. The alternatives model is not without its own contradictions, but nonetheless, it succeeds in explaining many aspects of reality. The alternatives model may not totally resolve certain known paradoxes of time and space, but it does at least iron out a few of the creases. Until now, we have been looking at the transitions from one lifeline to another in synchronicity with time. Lifelines have always existed in parallel to the temporal axis. In other words, the transition is always made from one point in time to the exact same point. Imagine if two lifelines existed that were not parallel to the time axis. 
a projection of the same point from the two lines onto the time axis would show the points in different places. The transition between them would indicate a shift in time into the past or the future. Depending on the direction of the obliquity, the relative steepness of the declination would define the extent of the time difference between the two points. By analogy, if two lifelines were not parallel relative to the space axis, the transition through space from one point to the other would happen instantly, or at least at an unbelievable speed. The steepness and direction of the gradient would determine the distance and direction involved in the shift. This is obviously a very rough explanation, but sufficiently acceptable to the relevant context. The painstaking listener will no doubt object, but what about the paradox, the contradiction of cause and effect relationships in time travel? Suppose I went back in time before my birth and brutally murdered my parents. How then did I come into the world? Within the framework of the alternatives model, this is only a seeming paradox. I cannot be born into that same lifeline, but so what? I can be born into a different lifeline. You may recall that there are an infinite number of lifelines, alternatives, where I both exist and where I do not exist. The most bloodthirsty paradox lover could even return to their childhood, meet with themselves, and do away with the innocent creature. In this scenario, the listener would not be meeting with their actual self, but with a separate, realized alternative which exists along with endless others. The past cannot be changed because it has already happened. It happened not only because a past section of a lifeline was realized, but because the alternatives of those past events already existed. In this sense, you could say the same thing about the future, that it has already happened. And so, cause and effect relationships are not contradicted in the phenomenon of the shift from one lifeline to another. You could cross out one of the frames in a film roll, but it would not damage any of the other frames. Time is static. It is only the realization of potential lifeline alternatives that has the quality of dynamic change. The force for realization moves across lifeline alternatives in the same way as a circle of light from a torch moves across forest trees in the dark. It is, however, possible to travel into the past or the future on one and the same lifeline, and here we do come across a paradox. Is this not why the predictions made by clairvoyance are only approximate and often, quite simply, inaccurate? Clairvoyants are somehow capable of scanning fragments of the future. If these scanned fragments are part of other lifelines, then it is easy to explain the element of error in their predictions. The alternatives model has it that the greater the distance between one line and another, the greater the difference in the scenery. Scientists are also baffled by the movement dynamics of UFOs. They accelerate instantly, then stop or make sudden changes in direction at right angles. Given the quality of inertness, this type of movement pattern is impossible to say nothing of the huge stress it would cause to the inhabitants of these devices. From the point of view of transurfing, there is nothing supernatural about these phenomena. Aliens do not experience physical stress because UFOs do not fly like an aeroplane or space shuttle. It is probable that what we are observing is not so much the movement of the object as its realization at different points in the alternative's space. 
Much remains unclear to us in questions relating to the heart and mind. Materialistic science presents the world as if it were a mechanical system. In other words, matter is primary and determines consciousness. However, in the light of recent achievements made by the same area of science, this model is increasingly losing its position of authority. The substitution and review of scientific models will be an ongoing process all the while that man erroneously believes himself to be capable of penetrating to the very essence of the laws of nature. A simple hen could equally well express its preferred concept of the creation, construction, and development of a poultry farm. Man stands a rung higher than a hen in his intellectual evolution, but that does not bring the infinite complexity of the world any closer. Man is not meant to know and understand everything. The pendulums of science and religion that claim to represent the last instance of truth have won their dominance not so much on account of a correct interpretation of the truth as on account of the fact that they have successfully persecuted their dissidents. The constant conflict exists not only between the pendulums of science and religion but also between individual branches within the same pendulums. The battle is ongoing, and it is a battle not for the truth, but for adherence. When I was substantiating the mind's inability to store all information, I based my argument on the model of imagining information in the form of computer bytes. However, this particular model could turn out to be incompatible with the neural activity of the brain. Who knows how information is really stored? Imagine, how would a scientist have researched a television or radio if they were born in an age prior to the invention of these devices? They would have tried pushing buttons, removing various parts, and watching for changes on the screen. Not having any idea how a TV works and basing their findings on the results of scientific observation. The scientist would have come to various conclusions at the root of which would stand one seemingly undeniable fact. A television generates all these different programs by itself. They are born right there in the transistors and microcircuitries. This is roughly how adherents of the mechanistic model explore the human brain. It is true that damage to individual areas of the brain can have a predictable impact on a person's perception and cognitive ability. The functional principle of the human intellect, however, remains a mystery. And yet, these adherents conclude that matter, and nothing else, determines consciousness. Conservative followers of the mechanistic model proudly refer to themselves as scientists and declare, haughtily, that their science is the true science based on factual information and not the speculations of amateurs. Anything that fails to fit the theory is declared anti-scientific and is not only rejected but made the object of persecution. Fortunately, the number of scientists of this nature is dwindling. You may agree or disagree with the information shared in this text. Either way, remember that it is just a model. No one can say exactly how things really happen. The mind tends to negate anything that does not fit into its context of sensible explanations. Until the mind is convinced of the rational nature of knowledge, it will never allow it to be integrated into the worldview template. Transurfing works. Of that, there is no doubt. But to apply it, the mind must have its explanation. 
The alternatives model gives us the benefit of some solid ground beneath our feet, but no more than that. It remains nothing more than a diagram that could be transformed into a more sophisticated model. For example, you could get rid of the assumption that so-called lifelines exist, which would make the early part of the book easier to understand. This would transform the alternative space from discrete to continuous. There would no longer be any paths through the forest. Only the forest would remain. Yet, this would not change the essence of transurfing. No matter what the model is, it can only ever provide an approximate, more or less adequate, reflection of reality. The path of studying reality is as eternal as the diversity of natural phenomena is infinite. You may have noticed that the transurfing principles overlap with the principles of similar teachings. There is nothing strange about that. Any teaching is relatively insular and represents an autonomous model. However, given that we are all people with roughly the same quality to our worldviews, different models will have certain aspects in common. To ask which of these many models provides a more adequate description of the world is pointless. The only thing of any significance is the practical results one can achieve from any given model. You could take mathematics, for instance. Different branches of mathematics represent separate models which describe material realization. A physics problem can be solved in different ways depending on the mathematical apparatus applied. There is no point in arguing whether analytical geometry or differential calculus is better in either case. You can only choose which particular approach you prefer. You too must make your choice. The Intention of the Ancient Magicians In conclusion, I would like to align myself with the intention of the ancient magicians. By this, I mean the knowledge keepers who lived in our reality until the breakup of the civilization that existed before this one. Fragments of this knowledge have been preserved to this day in the form of isolated esoteric teachings and practices. There is information to suggest, although not yet proven, that certain ancient magicians shifted into a different reality and at this time are trying to pass their knowledge to humanity by transcendental means. Until recently, I would have treated claims like these with more than a healthy level of skepticism. Yet, over the past few decades, there have been an increasing number of cases where people in different parts of the world have independently put forward similar interpretations of the same knowledge. Now, I, too, have come into intimate contact with this same type of knowledge, which, as I said, I could never have made up myself. I cannot say with confidence whether the Guardian, the meeting with whom I described in the first chapter, exists, at least in our reality. Having said that, I do have plenty of reason to suppose that he does, in fact, exist. I have come across many different characters in dreams, but they had absolutely no effect on my highly conservative worldview. My meeting with the Guardian not only turned my worldview upside down, it turned my life around. Suddenly, for no particular reason, a former physicist showing no previous signs of aptitude started to write books. It would be too incredible and extravagant to accept that the motivation for all this was a run-of-the-mill dream. The Guardian never appeared to me again after that first meeting, although 
Sometimes it seems to me that I can feel his presence. Either way, I have never considered transurfing my own knowledge. I am just a repeater tuned into the corresponding area of the alternative's space. I do not consider the work to be my own merit, although, I must confess, I found it extremely difficult to express and systematize the knowledge of transurfing. It is one thing to learn something, but quite another to be able to talk about it. You too will not only learn about this knowledge, you will assimilate it. For, having devoured the book in one go, you will not have received knowledge so much as an awareness and adeptness. These are different things. Transurfing offers quite concrete methods for turning your dreams into reality. This might not be enough for some people. If you are looking for tricks that can be spelt out like the procedure for tying a tie, you could spend your life searching in vain. Creating your own fate cannot be reduced to a simple rule that goes Step 1, 2, 3. Transurfing cannot be reduced to a technique of executing certain moves. It is not about technique, but about becoming aware of your inner freedom and the feeling that you are master of the layer of your world. Once you experience that feeling, everything will unfold of its own accord without the need for any particular technique. In order to achieve this level of awareness, you have to make transurfing a way of life. There is no other way. It is not at all laborious or burdensome. It is actually quite entertaining, like playing with a mirror. The world is a mirror of your relationship to it only with a delayed reaction. By comparing your relationship to the world with the subsequent reaction of the mirror, you teach your mind a simple truth, and yet one that is difficult for one's consciousness to truly assimilate. You shape the layer of your world with intention. It is also essential to become comfortable with the simple but strange truth that you do not need to be concerned with the means and ways of achieving the goal. One fundamental principle lies at the foundation of this statement. The focus of intention determines the vector of the alternative's flow. All you have to do is maintain the focus and let the alternative's flow take its course. The means of achieving the goal will present itself you cannot and need not know exactly how the goal will be realized. Whatever happens, if you keep your target slide in mind and observe the principle of coordination, the alternative's flow will carry you to your goal. Such is the law.